Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are talking about the glycine receptors and their role in hyperecplexia. Okay, so we've drawn this picture of the um, cross-section of the spinal cord. Okay, so we now want to see what is the role of glycine in the spinal cord in inhibiting these alpha motor neurons. So basically, synapsing onto the alpha motor neurons, you have a bunch of interneurons, shown here, so this is another little neuron, which is known as an inhibitory interneuron. So this neuron is known as an inhibitory interneuron. And these neurons are going to synapse with the alpha motor neurons, and they're going to make it less likely that the alpha motor neurons will fire an action potential. Now, how do they make it less likely that the alpha motor neurons fire an action potential? Well, basically, they release glycine onto this alpha motor neuron. So, if we show this synapse in a bit more detail, or at least in a bigger picture, then what we'll have is the axon terminal of the inhibitory interneuron here, uh, which will be glycinergic. It will be releasing glycine. Okay, so this axon terminal is releasing glycine, and the free letter amino acid code for glycine is gly. Okay, and then it will be acting on. Oh dear, this the table is very uneven. Uh, this is on, it will be acting on a dendritic spine on the dendrite of this alpha motor neuron. So the alpha motor neuron, if I just draw a little picture of its cell body. So its cell body will look kind of like this. It will have a huge number of dendrites coming off like this, okay? Like so. And then it will have its axon coming off here and its cell body, uh, well, its cell nucleus here. So it has these dendritic processes coming off it. Now, off the dendrites then uh, come uh, little processes known as dendritic spines, okay? So this is representing a dendritic spine, and uh, these dendritic spines um, are the um, little structures which interface with the axon terminals of other neurons and therefore collect the input from other neurons. So basically, uh, these are the structures which the axon terminals are actually synapsing onto on the dendrites. Okay, right. So, how does glycine have an effect on this dendritic spine? Well, basically, it acts on glycine receptors, which are in the membrane of this dendritic spine here. So, let's show this here. So, this is supposed to represent a glycine receptor drawn by crudely. Okay, so let me colour it in. So, in pink here, this is a glycine receptor. Okay, so then let's discuss what's going to happen when glycine binds to and activates the glycine receptor. Okay, and for this we'll go over the page. So, basically, what happens is the glycine receptor starts off in a closed but resting form. So let me show this. So this is the phospholipid bilayer, so these are the two uh, layers of phospholipids, the inner and outer leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. And then we have the receptor here, like so, uh, which um, is in the closed resting state. So you call this the closed, but then you put forward slash to it, and then resting to show that this is the closed resting state. Okay, and there are different closed states, so this is not trivial, basically. Uh, it's not something that you can just uh, abandon to mention. It is important that it's the closed forward slash resting state. Now, basically, when glycine binds to uh, the extracellular domain of these glycine receptors, it's going to cause the glycine receptor to open. So let's draw this new picture. Now, basically, it is not known how many glycine molecules bind to a glycine receptor. So, I will draw uh, some ligand bound to the glycine uh, receptor extracellular domain on here. So, I'll draw a little box here to represent the ligand. Uh, but don't take that to mean that one glycine molecule binds to the glycine receptor. We don't know how many glycine molecules bind to the glycine receptor. That's something that will emerge in the next... Uh, 10 years or so. Um, so watch that space. Okay, so when the ligand binds, it goes into the open state. Okay, so this is the process 
of ligand binding. Uh, have I got room to put the binding? Yes, I have. Okay, so let's colour in these pictures. Right, so we'll have in red the glycine receptor. And I'm just drawing the glycine receptor in this very simple way, uh, where I'm just showing it as basically a box with a tube down the middle. Um, but we'll discuss the structure of the glycine receptor properly in a moment. Okay, so we're just looking at its function at the moment. Uh, so we've got our ligand bound. We'll have the ligand in blue there, this little blue dot. Okay, and basically when the ligand binds it goes from being in the closed resting state to being in the open state. Nothing complicated yet. However, it doesn't stay in the open state. Instead, what happens is after a certain amount of time it's going to leave the open state and go into what's known as the closed desensitized state. So it's going to go back into a closed state where there is no pore down the middle, and we'll discuss what comes through the pore in a moment. Um, and it's going to go into a closed state, so there is no pore, so no ions are going to move through this. However, it still has the ligand bound, so this is a different state to here, and it's different in more ways than just the fact that the ligand is bound. The actual way in which you achieve the closure here is different, basically. If you were to look at the molecular structure of the receptor in this state, it would be different to the re receptor in this state, and not merely different because you've got a ligand molecule attached. Different um, in the way that it achieved being closed, basically. So this is what's known as the closed, and then you put a forward slash desensitized state. Okay, right. So let me colour that one in as well. So, this... Um, going from being in the open to the closed desensitized state stops the movement of ions through the pore of uh, the glycine receptor. Okay, now the next question that should be burning on your mind is, well, how long does it take for these glycine receptors to go from being in the open to go being in the closed uh, desensitized state? Well, basically the answer is it's probabilistic. There is no set answer to how long a receptor will take uh, to go from the open uh, to the closed state, i.e. how long it will remain in the open state for. There's no set answer to that. Uh, and it's not even set for a specific receptor. If you take a specific little single glycine receptor and you measure the time uh, that it takes for it to from opening to going into the closed desensitized state, then it will vary between different trials, basically, so it's probabilistic. However, even in probability, what we can do is come up with an average amount of time that it takes to go from uh, the open to the closed desensitized state, and this is what's known as the mean open time for uh, the glycine receptor. Oops, what am I doing? Opten time. Okay, mean open time. Right. So, um, that's the opening kinetics of the glycine receptor. Now let's actually discuss what happens when it is in this open state temporarily. Well, basically the glycine receptor is a uh, anion selective channel. It allows chloride anions to move through its pore. So, we need to know which direction are they going to move when it opens. And in order to understand which direction they're going to move, we need to uh, know two things. We need to know the concentration gradient of chloride anions across this uh, cell membrane. And we also need to know the electrical uh, potential gradient across the cell membrane. So we'll start with the concentration gradient. Basically, the concentration of chlorine chloride anions in the extracellular fluid is approximately 110 millimolars. I mean, these statistics vary uh, depending on uh, where you actually get them from. However, everyone sort of quotes a value generally around there, so it's somewhere around 110 millimolar. Whereas the intracellular concentration of chloride anions is around 4 millimolar. So you've got around a 30-fold gradient favouring the movement of chloride in. So the concentration gradient says move the chloride in, basically. Okay, so concentration gradient says move chloride in. 
Uh, however, we now need to factor in the electrical potential gradient across that cell. So I just want to make sure everyone understands what uh, I mean by the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. So, basically, if you had a little man standing in the extracellular fluid, he could measure the electrical potential of that extracellular fluid. Now, electrical potential is a concept in physics. It is a mathematical structure to help us understand uh, reality, basically. So, the mathematics of it is that to every point of space, of 3D space, uh, you ascribe a real number, which can be positive, negative, or zero. So every point in three-dimensional space is ascribed some number, and that number is the electrical potential of that point in space. So the electrical potential of all the points in the extracellular fluid is roughly the same. So I want you to go into the extracellular fluid and use a device to measure electrical potential and uh, get that number out. So you. A little man with his electrical potential machine measures electrical potential in the uh, extracellular compartment and he'll get some answer. He can then move into the intracellular compartment and measure the electrical potential, big E, and then I'll subscript it I to denote intracellular. So he can measure electrical potential intracellularly as well. And these two numbers, the electrical potential extracellularly and the electrical potential intracellularly, are not the same number, basically. They are different. Okay? Now, uh, what we can therefore ask is if you were to move from extracellular to intracellular with this machine on, how much would the number that it shows change? Now, this is the concept of the electrical potential difference from extracellular to intracellular, also called the voltage from extracellular to intracellular, or just the resting membrane potential. Now, when people talk about the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane, they are being sloppy. Generally, people very, very rarely actually say the electrical potential difference from extracellular to intracellular. They assume that you know that they mean from extracellular to intracellular. Um, so they just sloppily say the electrical potential difference across the membrane with the understanding that you realise that it's from extracellular to intracellular. And this confuses people to no end. So it would be better if people actually did sort of explicitly say the electrical potential from extracellular to intracellular. It's not that much effort. And it would mean a whole host more understanding in biological community. Right, so um, what is this number then? Well, basically, what are we asking? We are asking how much does the number on the machine uh, change if you move from extracellular to intracellular? Well, this is going to be the new number on the machine when you arrive in the intracellular compartment, which is the electrical potential intracellularly, minus the old number on the machine, which is the electrical potential extracellularly. Okay, so that is what is meant by the voltage across the cell membrane. The electrical potential intracellularly minus the electrical potential extracellularly. And we'll continue this video, uh, we'll continue this discussion in the next video.